Let's uh, have a seat and get into the Word. If you got a Bible, let's open it up. First Chronicles, chapter 21. I know they were... Uh, I heard some banging in the cafeteria, so I go in the back, and I was like, what's going on? They're doing construction tonight. So I said, hey... How about we stop for an hour? And uh, so we hear something start back up. I told Kirk, I said, go back there and take care of it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, bringing the big dogs there. Okay, so no. First Chronicles chapter 21. And let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come before you and we just thank you so much for your word. We ask, Lord, that you would just move by your spirit tonight and that you would just speak to our heart. We love you, Lord. And we ask that you would just, uh, Lord, just teach us the things that you want us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a lot here in chapter 21, and we're going to try to get to all of it. But remember that First Chronicles is a, uh, is a book that uh, goes over subjects that we've kind of already gone through in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. And so when you read Chronicles, you hear a lot of the same stories that we already had and we already went through. But it comes from a different point of view. So it's, a, it's like, a, like I always use this illustration having to do with the Gospels. It's one event uh, and different points of view. It's like if you were going to go down the street to, let's just say, Carson and Woodruff. And you see one of the famous accidents that happened in Carson and Woodruff. And uh, you have a couple different witnesses, and they, they t tell it from a different point of view. Same thing is going on with Chronicles. When you look at Samuel, and it, it, with Samuel and with Kings, it's more personable. It was like, more, hey, you know, let's talk about David. And you see that. And today we're going to look at David's second greatest mistake he ever made. Uh, some people say it's the greatest mistake he ever made, even more than Bathsheba. Ooh, jeez, wait, so you're like, how, what did he do? Well, he decided to, you know, count people. You're like, what? Well, that doesn't make sense. We'll, we'll get to it. But, um, but uh, Samuel and Kings is a lot more personable. Chronicle seems to be more business. And it just gets to the point. And so you'll see the differences tonight. And also it's one of those things that when you look at this, uh, they'll have different, um, how can I say it? In their point of view, they'll t say different numbers. And we'll get to that in a second. But with all this stuff, Chronicles, it, it, 2 Samuel focused on David a lot and what he thought and what, he, what his heart was. Chronicles is focusing on one thing. They're getting to the subject of the temple. They want the temple built. And they want to get to that, that topic of telling the story about the temple. And so we're going to get into that tonight. In chapter 21, verse 1, and so we're going to be going back and forth. If you want to put your finger in 2 Samuel 24, we will be going back and forth through the night. Put your ribbon back there or uh, make, a, make a note of it. But in 2 Samuel 24, this story is also written down for us. So let's compare the first two verses because it's very interesting. It's quite interesting. It says, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now, this is pretty scary. You, you see one of the, one of the uh, references in the Bible of Satan himself doing something. And what do we see Satan doing? He stood up against Israel. He came against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now, what's the big deal? First of all, let's just go back to the law for a second. In the law, in the Old Testament, which we still in the Old Testament, but the, the Torah, in the law, it has certain rules. We know that the people of Israel belong to God. That's how it is. The Jews belong to God. If you read the Old Testament, if you read all of the things that it says about the Jews in the Bible, they belong to God. They're God's chosen people. That's already said. Because they belong to God, God has a rule, and he laid this out for the kings and the leaders of Israel on how to do a census or how to count the people. And that's how detailed God was because he wanted it to be done right. And so God's rules are very simple. They're laid out in Exodus chapter 30, verse 12, if you're taking notes. And it says this. It's very clear. Rule number one, God calls for the census. In America, the Constitution calls for a census every, was it, 10 years? And so you have this 10-year thing where, you know, the American government does a, 
a census in America. There, it was God who's the one who called for it, not a constitution or a king. It was a God thing, according to the law, what God wrote down. What was the, how would they do it? Each person would be, they would count the number of, of people who would give an offering, a ransom offering of half a shekel, almost like a tax. And that half shekel tax was given, and they would count the amount of money, and that's how they would count the people. But God did not want the people counted willy-nilly. It's like, hey, you know what? Let's just count the people and see how much we got going here. And the reason why is he never wanted the leadership of Israel or the king of Israel to declare that the people of Israel belonged to them. They only belonged to God. And since so doing, he says, hey, I'm the one who calls it because they belong to me. You only count my people when I say you do. And so that was how it was. And so to do so was a sin, was to go directly against God's law. And any king that would try to do that, there was, or any leader, there was a problem. Now we have the book of Numbers, which is actually two censuses that God told Moses to do. And so those are legit. It hasn't happened since then. Now we know that there was a counting of the number of soldiers. We saw that in times of battle, and you see references made for those types of situations, but not the whole people of Israel. And so here we see that you just don't count the people. The reason why? They belong to God. Second reason, to keep the kings and leaders away from pride and ego. And also, it was in times of military striking or, or military call-up for military reasons. And if you count the people, it would probably be an ego thing to show off how much power you had. And so God said, no, don't count the people. Guess what David's going to do? He's going to count the people. And there's going to be a big, big, fat problem. And God's going to deal with it. But let's go back to our passage. It says, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now, flip back over to 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, and we see a different point of view. It says, again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Now, if you, anger means, uh, is the word off. Anger means off. It means nostril flaring. <laughs> Do you imagine just ticking God off that much that he flares his nostrils at you? Good grief. I would be scared. <sighs> oh, man, God's ticked. And, he, and he, his nostrils flare. The anger of the Lord was aroused. Uh, the word aroused means to get hot. He was ticked, okay, against Israel. And he was angry with the people of Israel. God smells something bad, okay? And so he was mad at Israel for something that the people did. And he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Well, wait, wait, in, hold up. In Chronicles, it says that Satan stood up and moved David. Here in 2 Samuel, it says that God moved David against them. Well, which one's right? Was it God or was it Satan? That's kind of freaky, Andrew. Is this one of those famous contradictions in the Bible? No, you just got to understand how God works. This is the thing. Which one was it? The anger of God was aroused against Israel. And God did move David against them. We don't know what Israel did. It might have been for Absalom and the whole Absalom scenario. We have no clue. Something happened where God had to chastise, and chastise is another word for give Israel a big spanking. He was going to correct the people because of something that they did, and they were in sin, and which is never fun. Well, when he does this, God needed to chastise, discipline Israel. So what does he do? He does something that God does. Because he's sovereign, because he could do whatever he wants because he's God, he allows Satan to do something. He allows Satan to work. Satan has free will within God's sovereign boundaries. He just does. If you want to get down to it, God uses him as a tool at times. We see this with Job. Remember the story of Job? where Job was a man of God, faithful to God, wonderful of God. And God was in heaven with the angels, and Satan showed up 
God says, where have you been? He goes, man, I've just been cruising earth. And he goes, well, when you've been cruising earth, have you been, did you check out Job? He's a faithful guy. And he goes, ah, Job, he would curse you to his face, face if you took everything away from him, God. And God allowed Satan to say, go for it. Watch what happens. And God allows Satan to strike Job, even his health taking his family away from him, taking his wealth and his possessions away, bringing him horrible counselors. And God was, said, just, hey, go ahead. And God was letting the world know as a testimony about Job's faithfulness to the Lord. And remember what Job said through that trial? The Lord give it, the, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he still blessed God through the whole trial. God allowed Satan to strike. And so what does Satan do? He tempted David to count the people. And guess what David did? He fell for it. He fell for it. Why would God allow Satan to do these things or anything? Why? Well, first of all, he's sovereign. God has a plan and a purpose for everything. So God allows Satan to do things. You're like, man, why does he allow him? That's crazy. I don't know. But I know his plans for us are wonderful. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring you a future and a hope. That's God's just a wonderful verse about God's plans for us. That's his nature. His plans for us are of good to give us a future and a hope. Even through the darkest of trials and the most worst times of our lives, God has a sovereign plan for us. And it is to bring us a future and a hope. His grace blossoms after the storms. You know, we're having all these rains now. They're saying in March, we're going to have a potential super bloom. And it's like, so when, now we're all bummed. We're like, oh, we're depressed with all the rain. We're just like, man, I'm just depressed. Where's the Oreos? You know, and I'm just all bummed out, man. I'm going to just, you know, oh, I'm just down, you know. And, but remember, spring's coming and it's going to be gorgeous around this time in California because of the storms. The same thing happens in our life when the storms hit. Guess what? Grace blossoms and just the blessings bloom better after the storms. And so he's sovereign. He has a plan and a purpose. Also, the reason why he does that, he wants to be glorified through our trials. When D David failed, but Job didn't. One of the greatest testimonies in all the world is the testimony of Job because he went through the trials and guess what? He was faithful unto the Lord. He had questions, yes, but he remained faithful. He still knew the Lord. He still called upon God's name. He still talked to God. He still declared God's greatness. And even through the trial, guess what? God's, God was glorified through his trial. And God allows us to be tested and tried by the enemy so that we can give great testimony to God. But now this is the sad thing. David failed. He wasn't like Job. He messed up. And he gave in to what Satan was tempting him in. But also, and lastly, why does he allow this? He desires us to be holy. God allows trials to purge us of some, just some junk in our lives. It's through a trial and a tough time where God allows the buffetings of the enemy, where he allows Satan to come in and and test us. And, and I'll tell you, through that testing, through those tough times, those fearful times, burdens are rolled away. Chains are broken. And worldliness is washed away. I'll tell you, it's, uh, during the darkest trials of my life, God has just purified my heart and mind. I'll tell you, I've never been more close to the Lord during times of trial. I'll tell you, it's, it's an amazing thing. So that's why he allows it. And you may say, I don't think that's fair, Andrew. It's totally fair. Well, how do you think that? Because he's God. <laughs> he can do whatever he wants. And he allows it. Well, isn't that God doing it? No. He's letting the enemy do it. But remember, there's always limits to what the enemy can do. 
And, and notice that. So if something's going on in your life from the enemy, God is allowing that for his glory to do something in your life. There's a reason and a purpose. I love when I had a friend a long time ago that said, Andrew, I'm being tempted in this area, but I know that God is letting me be tempted because you know what? He wants to show himself to be glorious. How great is that? I'll tell you, when things in our life are going just south, maybe God's showing you off to the heavenly host. He goes, have you considered my servant so-and-so? Brian, or Brad, or Ray, or Diane, or Kelly. Have you considered my servant? Oh! You're like, God, shut up about me. Just don't, don't say anything. I just want to remain neutral. I don't... No, no, shh. I'm going to be in the corner with my Bible. You know, just like, leave me alone. Maybe God's talking about you. That, I'll tell you, that's a freaky thing. But you know what? Remember, God, when, when we are being tried, that means he has a plan for us. And so here is David, and he fails. He fails. He doesn't remain faithful to God. He just does it. Well, I don't know why, but he does it. Verse 2, look at this. It says, So David said to Job and to the leaders of the people, Go, number Israel, from Beersheba to Dan, north to, north, to, north to south, and bring the number of them to me, that I may know it. And Joab, his general, answered and says, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord the king, are, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Joab is telling him, ah, why are you doing this, David? You don't have to do this. It's not good. Don't do this. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all of Israel and came to Jerusalem. So Joab did it. Joab didn't want to do it. Now, how did David fall? David, what happened? How did you fall? Well, how do we all fall? What, what, what do we, look at David. What, he, what did he not do? He didn't go to the Word at all. He didn't even go to the Word. No obedience to God's Word, the Word that he knew. He didn't even check. He didn't even, there was no, there's no reference to saying, let's go to the Word and find out if this, is, this should be done or not. If he would have gone to the Word, he would have hit, uh, he would have hit Exodus and go, oh, I guess this is not good. Let's not do this. But he didn't. He didn't go to God's Word. So we messed up. And how do we fall? How do we, how do we fail? Because we don't go to God's word. Uh, oh, 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 if we, could, if we could just stop in our decisions in our lives and say, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about this? And if we were to just say, Lord, let, what, let, let's get the counsel from God's word. I'll tell you, we would, we would not step in it. We just wouldn't. Notice what else is not here. No prayer. He didn't say, oh, let's, uh, Lord, I just want to... I, I, he didn't go down to Gibeah to, the, to the, t uh, the altar and say, hey, God, what should I do? Lord, speak to my heart. He didn't go to the umum and the thumum at the priest that had behind the, the, the breastplate and say, God, should I do this or not? Yes or no? He didn't do any of that. He didn't cry out in prayer to God. Uh, there was no... Uh, oh, and also, God sent him Joab. And he didn't heed or listen to godly advice. He just said, shut up, Joab. God sent him fellowship and good counsel, and he didn't heed it. Same thing with us. How many times is a friend, a godly friend, says, I don't think you should be doing that. I don't think you should do this. And we say, ah, I got this. Don't worry. Don't get your panties in a bunch. Back off. <laughs> you know? It's just like, it's so true. And, and I'll tell you, we don't heed the wise counsel. The other thing, there was no humility. There was no time where he said, oh, you know, I need to just humble myself before the Lord. He was amped on having the numbers. He, want, he was pride. I want the numbers. And there was also no discernment of spirits. You know, the Holy Spirit comes upon us as Christians and he has a gift for the church, the body of Christ, called the gift of discernment, discernment of spirits. Now, what is this gift of the Holy Spirit? It's all available to us because we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. The gift is the discernment of spirits, plural. Not discernment, okay? There's a lot of people that say, well, I have the gift of discernment. That's not a gift. 
That, <laughs> you're like, I have the gift of discernment. It's in the Bible. No, no, it's the gift of discernment of spirits. The gift of discernment is non-existent. Discernment happens when God gives you wisdom. And you can discern whether something is good or not. And because it's based on God's word and wisdom from the Lord, that's discernment. And God wants us to have discernment and wisdom. But discernment of spirits is something supernatural. It's a thing that you don't have that God comes upon you and gives you the gift of seeing if something is of the Lord, of the Holy Spirit, or of the spirit of Satan. Is this of God or not of God? And, and you get to know the spirit behind it, if it's of the Lord or not of the Lord. And that's the discernment of spirits, a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit that you could have at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is for edification of each other. Not to make you look all spooky, or say, I know what's going on. No, 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 no. It's to bless others. That's what the gifts are for. And, and he had none of that. And also, he had no understanding on how Satan tempts. You know, Satan is old school. And he has the same game plan always. First John says that Satan tempts us through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And he sticks with that game plan. You're like, well, why does he change it up? Because it works. He were, we fall to, for one of those three temptations every time. Temptations that go for our lust of the flesh. Oh, aren't you the greatest, Andrew? Oh, Andrew, aren't you the best thing ever? Oh, Andrew, aren't you the greatest? And then the lust of my flesh, my desires, the pride of life. Oh, pride of life. Lust of the eyes, what I'm looking at. Ah, oh. He'll tempt us in one of those three ways. And David wasn't watchful. He didn't see it coming. If we abide in the Lord, and especially in these things, check, going to the Word, going to prayer, heeding wise counsel, having humility, having the Holy Spirit fill us with the uh, with discernment of spirits, not, and, and knowing Satan, guess what? We'll see it, and David should have said, ha ha, whoa, 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 this is the enemy. I'm being tempted. But he didn't. He went, well, let's count the people. And he started to pull Count Dracula, one Jew, two Jew, three Jew. And he went to town. And how sad it was. And so verse 5 hits. And he says, now Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. And all of Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi, the tribe of Levi, and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was an abomination to Joab. He got sick of it. So he, it says that Joab, that's a total Joab move, you know, Joab in the Bible. He's like, I'm sick of this. I'm not counting Benjamin. And he didn't count Levi because he was sick of both of it. So he I was sick of it. So he didn't count either one of those, which they're the last ones on the list. He didn't finish the list. And when he got to Levi, Levi isn't supposed to be counted at all in times of war. And so he didn't count Levi. And so at least he obeyed the word of the Lord there. Joab did. But he says, I'm not even going to finish this list. And the number is different. Remember, okay, now there are these people who will come in and maybe you've noticed them. People who do not like the word of God, and they say, I have a contradiction that I have found in Scripture. What is it? Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 24, it says that when Joab counted the people, it was 800,000. And here it's 1,100,000. That's a discrepancy of 300 people. And they always get you on the numbers. You're like, well, is that a contradiction? No. Because in 2 Samuel 24, it says that the number of the valiant men was 800,000. And, and here in Chronicles, it says, and the number of all of Israel ready to carry the sword was 100, 1,100,000. It was different numbers. Valiant men could mean veterans or able-bodied soldiers that are ready to fight. All the people of Israel was 1,100,000 uh, men of war. 
So there's a different, if you just got to read the book. See, that's the problem with people that want to find contradictions in the Bible. They don't read the book. And so there is no contradiction here. And so you see the numbers. Joab counted. He was sick of it. And in verse 7, it says, And God was displeased with the thing. Therefore, he strikes Israel. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. David realizes his sin. Have you ever done that before, guys? When you realize, oh, crud, I've sinned. In Samuel, it says that his heart condemned him. It was his conscience. He got it. He, he came to his senses. Uh, now, remember, David had a heart after God's own heart. And if you have a heart after God's heart, you will always have a reaction like this to sin. In verse 8, you see that he has a conviction of sin. And he has a realization of sin. And he just hits, oh my goodness, I'm in the wrong. I'll tell you, that's the first step of repentance. It's the first step of getting right with God. When you realize, man, I have sinned. I, I, we all have had that, hopefully, <laughs> in our lives. We're like, my gosh. Maybe it happened when you first got saved. A person who doesn't know Jesus thinks they're totally fine. A person who is not born again, I'm good. I don't need Jesus. I'm fine. I'm a good moral person. No, we're all sinners. And when you have that realization about how vile you are, you're like, man, how dare you? You insult me, Andrew. Well, what's the truth? The Bible says in Romans that there is not one good. No, not one. We're all horrible people. But Jesus forgives. That's why God sent his only son, Jesus, to die for us. That's why I need a savior. You need a savior. Have you ever come to that conviction from the Holy Spirit, that realization about how bad you are? Now, pride will fight that. Your, our ego will come in and go, you're not that bad. Well, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty self-centered. No, you're not. You know what? You got to look out for number one. You got to look out for yourself. In, the, in your ego, we'll start like buttering you up. Isn't that crazy? And tests have proven that the brain actually does this subconsciously on its own. Like there's optical illusions that you'll see things that are not there because the brain doesn't want to admit that it can't see it and it's supposed to be there. That's amazing. Just imagine what it does when it confronts our own spirit life, our own sinfulness, which we all have as humans. That's why God sent Jesus and our ego and our, our pride go, you're good. Well, you know, you're special. You're good. And then God's like, oh, no, you need a savior. You need me. You need the blood of Jesus to wash your sins away. You need forgiveness and you can't forgive yourself. You can't do it. And then what does is, what is the flesh says? You have to just be kind to yourself. You have to forgive yourself first. I've heard it all. It's an amazing thing. But when you have that realization of conviction of sin, I need a savior because I'm a sinner. Then God can start his work. And then you see David starts to confess. He goes, I, I've done it. I've played the fool. I've done it. Admittance of sin. Confession. You don't have to confess to a priest. You don't have to confess to me. Please don't ever confess online. That goes public. You don't want that. But man, you confess to Jesus. That's what he's there for. He's the great counselor. And you go to Jesus and you confess your sins to him. And it says that he will forgive you. And then you repent. When you confess, you repent and go the opposite direction and start living for Jesus. And you do this by faith in Christ that he's the one that could do it. You know, Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who covers his sin will not prosper. If you cover your sin, if I cover my sin, we will not prosper. But the Bible says, 
But whoever confesses and forsakes the sin will have mercy from God. How great is that? I need mercy. 1 John 1 9 says, If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He will do it. Psalms 44 4 says, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. He'll hear that prayer. And you know what? I don't know if that, this pertains to you or maybe somebody in your life, but only God, God forgives all sin. There's not one sin that God looks at and says, you know what? I saw that. You know, I'm sorry. You're going to have to go to hell for stealing that Snickers bar at the CVS last year. You're going to hell for that. No, no. There's only one sin that sends us to hell, and that's that's when we reject the work of the Holy Spirit. You're like, well, when does that go down? That happens, I believe, the day you die. I believe that's the last time where, where God solidifies your rejection of him and he agrees with it. So therefore, and, and we don't know when that happens, but I'll tell you one thing. If you care about that sin, you're like, I hope I haven't done that. Then you haven't committed it. Let me tell you, guys, let me tell you something. God will forgive anything. In Psalms 51, David writes down his confession, his forgiveness, his asking God to forgive him of his sins when he slept with a woman, named, a married woman by the name of Bathsheba, got her pregnant, and then murdered her husband. <laughs> that sounds bad. That, that, this is like, whoa, that just sounds bad. I know it is bad. And God forgave him for all of it. And in Psalms 51, he writes down, what was on his heart when that happened. And if you ever need a passage to just ask God to forgive you of your sins, just read Psalms 51 to the Lord and make it your own prayer. I'll tell you, you won't regret it because that one hits, man. It hits. It says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to your multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. I, I can't forget it. But you and you only, against you I've sinned. And done this evil in your sight, O oh God. I haven't sinned against man or me. To you, I've sinned to you, God. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was born in sin. And my mother conceived me in sin. Behold, you desire truth in my inward parts. You want me to be holy. And in the hidden parts, you will make me to know wisdom. And then he says this in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. The blood was on the hyssop. Wash me in your blood, Lord. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Man, that's a prayer of forgiveness. Have you sinned against God today? Have you blown it? Have you failed God? Then come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. And he'll forgive you. There's not one sin that's so great that he won't forgive it. He loves you. He loves you. Don't you want to be clean today? Don't you want to be holy? Get holy. You're like, well, I've done, I've done it so many times. I've asked him to forgive me so many times. He's going to run out of times. No, he won't. No, he won't. It's called the manifold mercies of God, that manifold word. Manifold is not a piece of a car. Manifold mercies of God means they are never ending. Wow. You know, if you wrong me five times, good chance I'm over you. <laughs> but this is the thing. With God, you can wrong him and still come back to him, and he'll still forgive you. So that's you. Know that today. Maybe you needed to hear that. If you need to confess, do it soon. And always be quick to ask God to forgive you, and he'll forgive you. 
That's just how he is. Back in verse 9, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, a prophet of David, or a prophet of God for David. And he said to Gad, he goes, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I will offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came up to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either of these three things. Either three years of famine or three months defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you or else three days of the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what, I, what, uh, consider what answer I should take back to God who sent me. So man, God tells Gad to tell David, he says, tell him this. Pick one of three. Ooh, that's harsh. What if, you, you know, what if your dad came in when you were a kid and said, okay, pick one of them. You want to get whipped? Do you want to do this? Or do you want to do that? Oh, I was like, oh, that's torture. Pick. I can't pick that. Oh. Wouldn't that be horrible? And God is doing that with David. Pick one. Pick one. What do you want to, how, how do you want your punishment, David? And punishment for the nation of Israel. Three years of famine? Three months of being defeated by your enemies or three days of plague? Which one? <laughs> it's like, good grief. So in verse, um, you know what? Famine, foes, and plague. Famine, foes, and plague. Is not that the result of sin within our life? You have tremendous dryness, famine. Lean years when you're in sin. Your enemies have victory over you. And then corruption in the heart, plague. It's a spiritual thing. And so in verse 13, what does David say? And David said to Gad the prophet, I am in great distress. I'm freaking out. Please let me. F and I love, oh, guys, this is a great verse. And he says, please let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hands of man. Whole. He goes, listen, the hands of men I will not recuperate from. But the hand of God, that's where I want to fall into. How true is that? For, and why does he say into the hands of God? For his mercies are very great. Wise move, David. The manifold mercies of God. God's, get, listen, God's corrections are always steeped, surrounded, buttered in mercy. Just always are. But just like we willfully sin, we must willfully run to Jesus and leap into his hands. And when you run into the hands of Jesus, you're going to realize one thing. They're nail scarred. He died for our sins. It's the blood of Jesus that will forgive us for a multitude of sins, the Bible says. And David knew that. I want to be in the hands of God rather than the hands of men. How true! I need to do that with everything in my life. And trust and um, help. I don't want to rely upon the hands of mankind. You know, we rely so much upon the hands of mankind. And, and th well, there are some things that we, we rely upon. I just found out that Ryan's a handyman. As you know, I don't know how to do any of that. And I was like, I said, what do you do for a living, Ryan? And he goes, I am a handyman. I, I, I work on this and that. And I was like, going, oh. The Lord has brought you to my house. <laughs> I was like, oh, right on. I said, I, I text Kelly in the back. I'm like, dude, guess what Ryan does? He's a handyman. Praise the Lord. And, and Kelly's like, thank God you're, you won't ruin the house anymore, Andrew. Praise the Lord. You know, and I'm like, no, praise the Lord is good. And, uh, and, but that's the thing. It's just like, dude, you know, we need, and I was like, oh, he's a handyman. God's hand, he's a handyman. I want his hands. It's his hands I want to rest upon and rely upon and, and just, just to chill out because his, his, his mercies are very great. Isn't that wonderful? It's just some good stuff. And so he says, Lord, I'm going to go with God on this one. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel. 70,000 men of Israel fell throughout all the land of Israel. You see, sin affects not just you, it affects others. 
And in verse 15, and God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord looked and relented in dis, uh, uh, of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, it's enough, angel. Now restrain your hands. And the angel stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And then David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, having in his hand a sword drawn stretched out over Jerusalem. So David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell on their faces. They repented. They were, they were mourning. How, what a scary sight that would be. He, they actually saw the angel that was causing the plague. And it wasn't just, and when God told him to stop, he still had his sword out, stretched out over Israel. And he just paused and he froze. And this angel is hovering above Jerusalem by the threshing floor of Ornan. And David sees this, which is just, it's close, probably about a quarter of a mile away, and they run out and they bow down in mournful cloth, not their royal robes, but the elders and them put on sackcloth and, and, and they mourn and repent and they cry out to God to not kill them in Jerusalem and to stop the slaughter. And God saw that and he says, stop angel, but he didn't put his sword away. A scary sight. And you're like, well, where's the threshing floor of Ornan? If you look at Jerusalem, and in any picture of Jerusalem, you'll see that Dome of, the, Dome of the Rock Mosque. You know what I'm talking about? That big golden dome in Jerusalem? That flat area is the threshing floor of Ornan. And so that's the spot. And so he was by that area. Around there, his palace was just to the south of that. They all run out. They start crying out to God. They see that. And so there's still a chance that it might start up again. In verse 17, and David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep... What have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord, be my God, be against me and my father's house and not against your people, that they should be plagued. Here is David's shepherd heart coming out once again. He was worried about the sheep. He was worried about the sheep. He, remember, David is the tribe of Judah. And Judah in the Old Testament, he did the same thing when the second in command of Egypt, it turned out to be his brother, was going to take Benjamin away. And Judah said, I'll be the substitute. I, I'll take it. David, a member of the tribe of Judah, again being the substitute. I'll be the substitute. Don't take it out upon the sheep. Take it out on me, David says. You know, everything that's going on in this Jerusalem area has to do with substitution. We, we see this with Abraham and Melchizedek bringing out symbols of communion. And Melchizedek, the high priest of the area of the city of Salem, which is where David is ruling, ancient times, they had a gift of bread and grape juice, bread and wine, symbolic of communion to foreshadow what all that was coming down in that area. In the same area, in the same area, if you walk up from the city of David and you go north, and you go up what is known as Mount Moriah. You pass and walk by Mount, uh, the threshing floor of Ornan. It then goes up another 25 feet to the high point of the hill. That is where Abraham sacrificed or tried to sacrifice Isaac. And God prepared for him a sacrifice. He says, hey, don't kill your son, your only son Isaac. Look in the thicket. There's a ram. Kill him instead. And there was a substitute for Abraham and that symbolism there. Also back in the threshing floor of Ornan, a couple of hundred years, or a couple of years after the story that we're covering tonight, Solomon's going to build his temple right there. And sacrifices in the temple, substitutions of sheep and goats and oxen. Instead of you, it's going to be this animal. Substitution. And of course, another thousand years later, if you go back up to the very tip top of the Mount Moriah, inside that, they carved a, 
uh, like a little quarry, and inside they killed, the Roman soldiers killed people on the crosses. And on that same exact part where Abraham was trying to sacrifice his only begotten son, the father sacrificed his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, in the same exact location. How crazy is that? All this substitution, and here's David crying out, I'll take their place. Take me out as my sin. And Jesus, and get this, David's descendant, the son of David, will ascend that Mount Calvary and do the same thing for us and to the Father and say to, to God, I will become sin. I will die. Punish me instead of them. And God will say, yes. I will punish my son instead of the, of the world. I will pour out my wrath upon you, Jesus, son of David. That's what Jesus did for us. He took our sin. He died for us. He's the substitute. Their propitiation. That's what he's done for us. And so in verse 18, Therefore the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to tell David and that David should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So David, so he says, build an altar. And notice Abraham's altar is not there anymore. Abraham's altar is not there. You know why? It wasn't in the threshing floor of Ornan. It was to the north, to the north, on the very top of the mountain. Here is a different location. So some people say that Abraham sacrificed Isaac at the threshing floor of Ornan. No, that's where Calvary is up to the north. This is what David did here. This is where the temple was. And so he builds an altar there. Never was, there was never one there before. And in verse 19, so David went up at the word of God, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan, get this, Ornan, the guy who owns the threshing floor, that flat part where the Dome of the Rock mosque is now, he's there threshing wheat. Now you're like, what's threshing wheat? They harvest all the wheat, they beat it and they crush it, and then they're on top of a hill and the breeze is there. And they throw the wheat up in the air and the breeze separates the covering of the wheat from the kernel. And the kernel is heavy and it drops and the wind carries the chaff away. And that's how they separate the wheat from the chaff. Ornan is there doing his business. Okay, and he's there on the threshing floor. And now Ornan turned and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him ran away and hid themselves. I don't blame those kids. They said, there's an angel. I'm out of here. Bye, dad. And they, he ditched the dad. Now, Samuel says that the servants and Ornan are there. The kids have left the building or left the threshing floor. Okay, the area. But Ornan continued threshing wheat. Now, if I saw an angel, and it's there with a sword out over Jerusalem, I'm following the kids. <laughs> I would be out of there. I mean, like, but Ornan looks up and he goes, oh. And he keeps on doing it. He's probably saying, hey, hey, angel, flap those six wings a little bit more. Give me a little bit more breeze on this. I don't know. That's just me. But he's just chilling. He's continuing his job. Why? Ornan stained to finish. Why wasn't he freaked out? Why wasn't he frightened? Well, look at verse 21. So David came to Ornan, and Ornan looked and saw David. And Ornan went out from the threshing floor and bowed down before David and his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Grant me, give me this place, this threshing floor, that I may build an altar here and on it to the Lord. And you shall grant it to me at the full price. I'm going to pay top dollar for this land and for this threshing floor. That the plague may be withdrawn from the people. So what did David ask? I want to pay full price for this piece of land. I want to buy it all at top dollar. But Ornan said to David, Ah, oh, king, just take it for yourself. Let my lord the king do what is good in his eyes. Look, and I'm also going to give you my oxen for burnt offering and the threshing implements that you cut up uh, for wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I'm going to give it everything I have to you. Ornan was a giver. He was a giver. Guys, let me tell you something. Ornan was a gracious man, a generous giver to God. Givers always have been given much by God. 
He was a recipient of grace. He was a reaper of grace. And they are all givers of grace. The Bible says, freely you have given, then uh, freely you have received, then freely give, Jesus says. In this life of grace, Ornan stood and continued without fear. I want that. He was such in tune with God's grace, and he had been given so much, he just, he was a giver. He had received much from God, and because of that, he was just, I know it's all going to work out, because he understood the graciousness that God had in his heart. It did not, he had no fear of the Lord, nor the angels of the Lord. He didn't, he wasn't scared. He knew that the Lord was full of grace. And so he continued. It didn't phase him. And so he says, David, I'll give you everything I have. You want it? Take it. Well, David said, no, I'm going to buy it. Then King David said to Ornan, no, but I will surely buy it for full price. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. Sacrifice always costs us something. Always. What does it cost us? Romans 12.1 says that we are a living sacrifice unto the Lord. It costs us us. God wants you. In Hebrews 13.15, talks about the sacrifice of praise. You, don't want, you want to know what a sacrifice costs? It costs you your praise. He wants all your praise. Hebrews 13, 16 and Micah 6, 8 talks about our good works being a sacrifice unto the Lord. You know, what, you know, what is God required of you? But to do justly, to end to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God, according to Micah 6, 8. Hebrews 13, 16, it's everything that we do unto the Lord is a sacrifice unto God. Romans 15, 16 talks about how when we lead people to Christ, it's a sacrifice of the Lord. It's an offering unto Him in Romans 15, 16. Ephesians 5, 2 talks about our love being a sacrifice unto the Lord, an offering to Him. And Revelation 8, 3 talks about our prayers being a sacrifice unto the Lord. True sacrifice always costs us something. Our lives, our praise, our good works, those people we lead to the Lord, our love and our prayers are all sacrifices and offerings unto the Lord. And in verse 25, so David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. Now here's a side note, guys. Here's another one of those number contradictions, quote unquote contradictions. They go, oh, well, you know, it says in Samuel, that it was 50 shekels of silver that he bought. Hold on. Read the book. It says in Samuel 24 that he paid 50 shekels of silver for something very specific. The actual threshing floor and the oxen. But for the whole place, like it says in Chronicles, he paid for the whole land 600 shekels of gold. He bought the whole mountain. He bought Moriah. And so that's, it's specific. Samuel talks about the threshing floor and the oxen. The whole place cost 600 bucks, or 600, not 600 bucks, 600 shekels of of gold. So it's different areas. So if anybody comes at you and say, there's a contradiction here, now you know. Verse 26, we're almost done. And it says, and David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offerings. And so the Lord commanded an angel, the angel, and he returned his sword to his sheaf. It was a sacrifices were made, and it satisfied the Lord. There's only one sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath, and that's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon Mount Moriah for us. He died for us. And God responded by what? Fire. Responded by fire. God responds to when we give our lives to Jesus. And Jesus takes our sin upon himself. God pours out his wrath upon his only son. And he responds to us with the baptism and the filling of the filling of the Holy Spirit. The fire of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. Guys, God fills us with his spirit. It's the proof that we're saved. 
And so there it was. He responded by the Holy Spirit. If you come back to the whole, back to God, if you've walked away from God and you repented and you returned to Jesus Christ, he brings his spirit upon you to empower you some more. He is there by the Spirit. The Spirit, the response by fire, he responds to that sacrifice. And in verse 28, at that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, he sacrificed there for the tabernacle of the Lord and the altar of the burnt offering, which Moses had made in the wilderness, were at that time at the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God for there uh, because he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. So he couldn't get to Gibeon where the old tabernacle was. He was afraid that he was going to die. So he said, I'm not going to go there. So, he, so guys, that's where they started to do um, um, the, the offerings of the Lord, and that's where the temple was going to be built. Now, on closing, out of the David's two great failures, Bathsheba and the census, God did something wonderful. Out of both of those things, with Bathsheba, from that relationship that started so bad in sin, God restored that relationship, and guess what he did? He brought about the throne of David, Solomon, and Nathan that would bring about Jesus Christ himself. That's his descendants through him. And then also the census, yeah, it was a horrible time. It was a sin, but God restored it, and he brings about the property in which the temple will be built right there where people can have atonement for their sins. Romans 5.20 is a great verse, and it says this, but where sin abounded... What happens? Grace abounded much more. How great is that? You know, so if you guys have blown it today, remember that God's not done. Get washed, get clean, get forgiven, but then also get ready because God's not done with you yet. Amen? Amen. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your word tonight. We ask that you would just continue to wash us and cleanse us. And Lord, let, we just ask that we would just grow, not just in your word and the spirit, but also in the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for forgiveness. Thank you for the mercy. Thank you for the grace. Thank you that you sent your son, Father, to die for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you came for us. How great you are. Lord, we're just blown away by your grace. We love you. And Lord, if there's any man or woman here tonight that just needs your forgiveness, let them cry out to you and ask for it, knowing full well that you will forgive them and start a new life in them. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name, amen. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. God bless you guys. I love you. And the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. Have a great rest of the week. And we'll see you later.